This is your lecture on labor unions and strikes, so you should be using the chart that you see in front of you for your notes. Um, so the last lecture that we talked about in discussion was about the wealthy industrialists, so Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, those types. And what we're going to look at today is the people that worked for those types of industrialists um, and what their conditions were like and what led them to go on some of the more famous strikes that we've talked about. Um, so first, what were the complaints about the labor system? So a big one was that child labor was entirely legal. So you can see children here working, um, really dirty conditions, no shoes. You can see the middle boy is uh, wearing some kind of um, jaw bandage or something like that. So again, very dangerous. Children were not protected from harm. Um, children as young as four or three could be forced to work. A lot of them were hired because they had smaller fingers and could get into some of the smaller parts of the machinery, etc. So again, really bad conditions, especially for children. Again, you can see children working here in a um, some kind of food processing factory. So again, big complaint, child labor. Um, another was just the dangerous working conditions, especially in mines. Um, lots of deaths, there was no workman's comp, no disability, that kind of insurance that we have today. Um, a lot of workers in mines and factories, like if you look back at the, um, the children working here, had a lot of respiratory problems. So in, in textile factories or in sewing factories, like you can see here, they'd be breathing in little balls of cotton. Um, in the mines, for example, there was a lot of coal dust, so you see just a lot of health problems. Um, children and adults all have really bad, um, they would have issues with their bones from the postures that they'd have to maintain for 13, 14, 15 hours a day, sometimes hunched over, etc. Um, another issue was how many workers they would squeeze into a space. So here you can see how closely these women are working together at sewing, um, some kind of shirtwaist or skirt making factory. So again, working in really close quarters, and this led to a lot of fire safety issues that we'll talk about later. So those are some of the complaints. Also for women, um, there was no protection against sexual assault. So there was sexual harassment, um, rape, etc. And there was no accountability for managers, owners, etc. that did that kind of thing. So again, no protection for women against that kind of harassment in the workplace. So um, what we start seeing are groups rising up. And this, these started before the Civil War, but you see more of them after the Civil War. Um, they are called organized labor or unions. Um, and the very first one, it was unsuccessful, was the Knights of Labor. You can see their, um, their image here. The Knights of Labor faded pretty quickly for two reasons. One is they tried to fix everything all at once. So they tried to fix conditions, wages, the, um, how long the workday was, overtime, etc. So just a lot all at once. And it was, they just bit off too much, essentially. In a, in a union, unfriendly environment, they tried to do too much too fast. Also, there is a very famous event called the Haymarket Riot, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in the lecture, but that made the Knights of Labor look really bad. And we'll talk about why again in a few minutes. So, um, following in their stead, we have the AFL. We still have the AFL today. It's the AFL-CIO. It's the American Federation of Labor, and you can see here um, that their big thing was the eight-hour workday and wages. So they focused on just two really big things, and because they were able to focus, um, they were much more successful, and again, it's why we have them today, um, because they kind of limited the scope of their actions and activities. So um, you will also hear about, at the turn of the century and then more into the 1920s and 30s, the IWW, the International Workers of the World, um, they were also nicknamed the Wobblies, um, another big international union, so not a national American union, it was international. Um, and then finally you have the Socialists. The Socialists were led by Eugene V. Debs. Um, socialists wanted um, beyond union um, protection in, in, in specific industries, the Socialists were kind of across all industries, they also wanted to reform the government um, and make the government play a much bigger role in protecting labor and labor rights. So, um, the next thing to talk about is how the government and how the owners responded to unions and tried to stop them. So like I said, in the late 1800s, 
unions were not popular. They were not the right to be in a union was not protected. Um, they were not popular with the um, kind of managerial owner, staff, etc. And so there are a couple different ways that the um, owners in government would block these unions and try to prevent strikes. And, and very frequently they were successful using these. So a big one that is used and is still used today is called an injunction. And that's where the courts would force an industry back to work. So, uh, and usually their argument was is that the industry was too important to be on strike. So for example, um, train car workers or train car producers that um, went on strike the government would say it's too important, it's hurting the um, transportation, it's, it's hurting the delivery of mail. So delivery of U.S. mail was frequently used as an excuse to break up a strike. Um, also, in many industries, workers, when they were hired, were forced to sign yellow dog contracts, and these were contracts saying that they would not join a union. Um, another one that is used were strike breakers. So if groups went on strike, um, the owners or managers would hire what are known as strike breakers, workers who are willing to keep working um, even during the strike. And so that hurt the strike's ability because things were still being produced. The industry was still running even with the, the workers on strike. And very frequently, these strike breakers were immigrants, immigrants who um, had just come over, recently come over from wherever they had emigrated from and were willing to work, maybe even a lower wage, um, and thus this led to a lot of animosity and hatred towards immigrants because they were used, again, as strike breakers. Um, another group that is famous, and you can see the image, the rather creepy image here, is the Pinkertons. Pinkertons were private detectives, is what they called themselves. They were private um, security guards, essentially private thugs that were hired to um, threaten families, threaten strike leaders, threaten union members um, to not go on strike or stop the strike. Um, lockouts, you heard a lot about them recently, more often in, in sports. Um, a couple years ago, there was the NBA lockout, and this is where, before the strike can happen, um, the business locks out the workers, saying that they can't work and they can't earn a wage. This happened with the NBA, where they, the, work, the players were not allowed to go and practice in the gym and work out before the season started. Um, and then finally, showing kind of which side the government was on, is calling in either state troops, state militia, or federal troops, the National Guard, to come um, force strikers to go back to work or threaten them. Because very frequently they are called in to stop strikers and protesters. Um, and what this again shows is that the government was usually on the side of industry, not on with the, the workers and the unions. So a couple big events that you should know about in labor history. One is the Triangle Factory Fire that we're going to go into more detail in class, but this happened in 1911, a little bit later than some of the other ones we'll talk about. And this is where it was a shirtwaist factory fire, so like um, this picture where women are all crammed into one room, um, furiously sewing away. They made shirtwaist. It's kind of like a blouse um, back when that style it used to be that women wore a full dress and the style was changing to be skirts and a blouse. Anyways, they sewed these. Uh, shirt waists, there were no fire safety standards, no fire drills, uh, stairwells were very um, small, elevators were not safe, um, and again, there were no um, sprinklers and things like that. So um, there is, the theory is, is that someone threw a cigarette, they're not sure who, into an old, like a garbage can full of scrap material, it caught on fire very quickly, spread very fast, and the women couldn't escape the, the, the rooms that were on fire. Um, in one situation, there was actually, the door was locked from the outside. They would do this to prevent the women um, leaving, taking breaks that they shouldn't have been, um, or stealing any of the, uh, the, fact, the fabric. So frequently they had to be searched before they could leave, and that door was locked. And so one part of a room couldn't escape. And ultimately, 146 People died, mostly women, mostly very young women, so teenagers your age uh, that were working there. Many of them um, burned to death, but a lot of them also jumped to their death. And you can see here this policeman looking up um, and the bodies of women who have jumped to their death to avoid bur burning to death. Um, and next one is the Haymarket Riot that I, t I kind of 
briefly hinted at before, this was a, a protest kind of, of of multiple laborers of multiple industries. They were there generally protesting for higher wages. A small group of anarchists, anarchists are people who want no government, showed up. Uh, they threw a bomb into the middle of this kind of peacefully protesting crowd. It went off, it killed uh, nine or ten people. And what it did is, even though it wasn't the Union who had thrown this bomb, had killed people, it made the Unions look bad, like they were anarchists, that they were out of control, and that to be in a Union meant that people were going to get hurt, there was violence and death. And so this really was the event that made the Knights of Labor look really bad. And if you look at charts of Labor Union membership, it starts to, to decline after the Haymarket Riot in 1886, because of fears of violence associated with unions. And so then in the 1890s, there are two big strikes. One is the Homestead Strike and one is the Pullman Strike. Both end in violence and kind of perpetuate this image that union membership means violence, it's dangerous, and again, gives unions a bad name. The Homestead Strike was um, against Carnegie's U.S. Steel. Um, the workers were, um, they wanted higher wages whereas the management was trying to lower the wages. And again, this is in 1892. Um, and they end up using multiple examples of the ways to break strikes that I had talked about. So they called in Pinkertons, they did a lockout, um, and ultimately they called in the state militia troops firing into the crowd. And again, you can see here some of the violence. This is a, a image drawn back then, but you can see injured people, etc. cetera. Um, and then finally, the Pullman Railroad strike was railroad workers, you can see them leaving here striking. Um, they were protesting, one, for wages, but also they were forced to live in company apartments. So they were not only forced to get low wages, but then they were forced to pay rent to their employer for these apartments that they were forced to live in. They had to pay to go to church, they had to pay to use the library, again, all of these things on the property of the Pullman Railroad Car Company. And so they were protesting all of these things, that they couldn't live elsewhere, they were forced to pay these really high rents when they were also getting wage cuts. This one was in 1894, um, also ended in violence, also ended in the use of troops being called in. So ultimately, the takeaway is that government was usually on the side of the, the industrial owners, the managers, um, and they also frequently sent in troops, which frequently led to violence and the death of strikers. And so we'll, we'll end there um, and use some of this information later on to talk about the Triangle Factory Fire and the trial we're going to do, um, and also to go into some of the debate we'll do about the impact of the industrialists of the Gilded Age. That's it.